Hello, everyone. My name is Shakela Alvarenga. I am the Director of Public Programs at the Mob Museum. Thank you for joining us. Over the past few months, we've welcomed authors from all across the country to take part in our virtual series, Writing the Mob, Chronicling Organized Crime in the 20th Century. And we hope that you've enjoyed this virtual program series. It is a pleasure to welcome our speaker for today's program, Anthony Stefano. He is a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative journalist and the author of The Deadly Dawn, Vito Genovese, Mafia Boss. With that being said, the Mob Museum's Jeff Schumacher will moderate this discussion. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Shakela. How are you? Uh, just down the just down the hall from me. Um, <laughs> Thank you for uh, that introduction, and uh, Tony, welcome to uh, welcome to the virtual series. Uh, this was the final, as Shakela mentioned, this is the final uh, uh, conversation that we're going to have in this series this year. And who better to uh, have than one of the sort of the deans of uh, mob history writers? So thank you for joining us, and. Um, uh, I wanted to mention that you know we're going to talk today about Vito Genovese, and and uh, this is your latest book. But you've written a number of other books. This is your eighth book, is that correct? That's Mar correct. That's correct. Yeah. And you've had books on Frank Costello. You've had uh, books related to John Gotti, uh, a number of other figures. And so uh, it's just this is the latest in a line of of really important books that help to chronicle this history. So, uh, you know, anybody who's watching today, I encourage you not only to get this book because this is a is, is a good one, but all the others of Tony's books as well. Um, I want we start Tony by having you sort of talk about why you decided to tackle a, a biography of Vito Genovese and and sort of kind of outline what's in the book. Well, Vito Genovese hadn't been the subject of a real in-depth biography for over 60 years. Uh, the last book was written about 1958 uh, by Dom Frasca. And uh, I talked with my publisher, and Vito has been sort of a mysterious character. You know, he's the namesake of the crime family. But he uh, really wasn't much was known about him uh, over the years. So I tackled the, decided to tackle the book. And the result, of course, after many months of digging around, and I had to do a lot of digging, was The Deadly Dawn, the cover of which uh, I think we'll be able to show uh, uh, as a graphic, and that's the, that's the cover. And I plunged into the research and, and spent about a good six to eight months digging into Vito's life, his past, and how to resurrect some old forgotten files. Now, Vito came to the United States and... Uh, about 1913. He was probably about 16 years old from the Naples area of Italy. And there really wasn't much remarkable about his life as a teenager apart from one drug uh, gun, gun arrest. Uh, I decided to tackle that and uh, many other aspects of his life. And of course, uh, you know, I got into his uh, his early rise to the mob, where he became very tight with some of the big old bosses in the Genovese, well, in the old Masseria crime family. And of course, he got his rise like everybody else in uh, Prohibition, got himself into some trouble. And Vito, of course, was a rather, his visage, his, his, his image, his, his, uh, we have a mugshot of him, I think, uh, early mugshot. Uh, was really, uh, he was a handsome guy, uh, but he had a very penetrating look. If we, you know, we get that first mugshot, you'll see it. Uh, he had a very uh, uh, almost severe look. You know, you look at those eyes and you can tell, you know, this is a guy that could be trouble. This is one of his early New York City mugshot photos. Now, at this point, he was tight with Mazaria, Joe Mazaria, the old boss. Luciano and a whole bunch of other people aligned with that sort of side of the uh, New York City emerging Italian crime uh, crime family. We then have, uh, of course, him getting his bones uh, and making a lot of money in Prohibition, which was really the jet fuel for the mob. And we have a picture of one of those rum running boats uh, off of Long Island, where which would bring in the booze to the Long Island, and we would eventually 
and this rum runner, there it is. Uh, it would get to New York, Vito, Luciano, Masseria were all involved in this. And uh, ultimately, of course, Luciano had his other plans and uh, decided to take care of uh, Masseria. And Luciano became the boss, as you well know, I think in your own history. We have a picture of Lucky, I think a mugshot. And everybody has mugshots as part of this crew. And he took care of Masseria and essentially became the preeminent boss in the 30s of the New York Mafia, which became its uh, you know, five family configuration at that point. But uh, Lucky didn't have much time on the street as the unfettered boss. He got targeted by Dewey and he got jailed and uh, had to be sent away to prison for a pretty long period of time. There's other aspects of that story we're not gonna get into now, but Genovese was really his sort of second in command at that point, but he had to flee also to Italy because he was getting out from under a murder case in Brooklyn uh, involving one uh, Ferdinand Boccia. Genovese went to Italy and became very tight, oddly enough, with Benito Mussolini, El Duce. We have a picture of El Duce, uh, who became the, I guess, czar and dictator of Italy. Uh, and he, of course, himself didn't last very long, but he was powerful. And Luciano, uh, rather Genovese, had a lot of money to spread around, and he gave it to El Duce's fascist party in a major donation which ingratiated himself with Mussolini and also with Mussolini's uh, son-in-law, Count Siano. Uh, we have a picture of Count Siano, who was Mussolini's foreign minister and reputed drug customer of Vito Genovese. So you have this drug connection now emerging at this point with Vito in, in Italy. Uh, of course, back in the, with Vito out of the picture from the United States, the preeminent gangster in Luciano's family was one Frank Costello. It was really, we have a picture of Frank Costello too, another mugshot. No, that's not a mugshot. That's a Senate hearing uh, picture. Uh, who became really the preeminent uh, boss for the time when Luciano was in prison of Luciano's family. And with Genovese out of the way, uh, Costello was the prime minister. And he had very good uh, you know, relations and uh, with politicians and whatnot and was very tight with Albert Anastasia. Another, we have a picture of Albert, and this is a mugshot, uh, who was uh, eventually part of the emerging, uh, uh, I suppose, a, a Gambino crime family uh, and a very powerful drug uh, uh, dock racketeer and part of Murder, Inc. Uh, but Genovese did come back to the United States after World War II and started to settle scores got rid of Anastasia in a fabulous murder case in 1957. And the reputed gunman there was Vincent the Chin Gigante, a broken down ex-boxer. And we have a mugshot, of course, of Vinnie the Chin, who took a shot at Frank in his hotel, in his uh, apartment building, missed him, didn't kill him. And uh, at that point, you know, I, I, Frank Costello said, I'm getting out. Now I'm going to lead and cede the territory to Vito Genovese. And Frank Costello, of course, then retired in about 1957 with his rifle Loretta to their manse out in uh, Sands Point to live a life where he was growing orchids and being a retired gentleman of leisure, uh, of course, being sought after by some politicians on the QT. Genovese uh, became uh, Vito Genovese at this point really had the feel to himself. And we have a picture, I think, of Vito uh, in part of his glory in about 1957 when he was testifying to Congress, took the fifth and hand, I think, 150 times, and was a boss. Uh, he figured he was going to make a run for things, and he set up the famous or infamous Appalachian meeting, which angered some of the mob because it drew a lot of attention to them. It turned out to be a disaster of sorts for Vito because the cops got onto it, uh, indicted a lot of mobsters, but not Vito, oddly enough. And uh, it became an issue. And Vito became a target in his own right. 
And about 1958, I'm giving you the broad brush treatment here, Vito was indicted on a drug case, sent to prison, and we have a picture of Vito in his prison mugshot. He's looking a little uh, perplexed and peeved here. Uh, he still looks pretty good, uh, but this is where he, uh, when he was down in Atlanta in the penitentiary. Of course, Vito tried to get out. He thought he was framed. He had all sorts of appeals. They came to naught. The drug case, while well, circumstantial, was enough to keep him in prison for the rest of his life. And prison, of course, doesn't do much for these guys. We have another picture of Vito in prison as an older man with his glasses. He had found religion at this point, helping the Catholic cleric uh, in the prison, the chaplain. And, you know, because at this point, he wasn't really going to get out of jail. Health deteriorated. In about 1969, Vito Genovese died in prison, in a prison hospital at the age of 71. He had a quiet funeral. We have a picture of that funeral in New Jersey. No mobsters showed up. Probably nobody really wanted to at that point. Show up to these funerals, you get a lot of heat. And he was buried in St. John's Cemetery. And we have a picture of the family plot where Vito is entombed with his first wife, Donata, and his second wife, Anna, who caused them all sorts of trouble uh, when uh, they had this widely publicized matrimonial tiff that got to court and she put the finger on him and saying he was the boss of all crime in New York City, sort of the Moriarty of the, uh, of the gangster world. And of course that didn't do Vito any good uh, for his stature. But they're buried together. And that's the sort of strange ending to that story in this very broad brush treatment I'm giving you. Uh, it's all encapsulated in uh, The Deadly Dawn. And uh, it was a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun. And it was an eye opener in some ways because of things that I found out about Vito. His wife, Anna, and his time in uh, overseas in Italy. Well, thank you, Tony. Uh appreciate that overview. I think what I'd like to do is circle back to a few of the a few of the sort of the high points or, or the low points, depending on the situation, uh, you know, during his life. And so uh, why don't we start by, but before we do that, I want to ask you sort of about like, what additional materials did you dig up for this book? What did you find out that had not been previously published? Well, I think that one of the things I found out was the... Uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, his immigration case, uh, his citizenship was pulled, uh, in the 1950s and there was a number of depositions and he gave an interesting resume of sorts of his life and his family, uh, his wife, Anna, the children, the stepchildren and what he did with them. And, uh, how many arrests he had and how he sort of screwed up by not reporting the arrests to the immigration authorities. That got him in trouble, got his citizenship revoked at that point. Uh, that was interesting, that deposition. I also found a counterfeit currency case that Vito was involved in that uh, got little publicity in his biographies, but I was able to dig it out. It was a Brooklyn case. And he was accused of being part of a counterfeiting ring that was producing counterfeit gold uh, certificates. Gold certificates at a certain time, of about the 30s, were uh, legal tender of sorts. And But he got out of it, like he did with many of his cases. He got out of it because they couldn't find him. So they tossed the case, and they said, we can't find him. I don't know how they couldn't find him. He had a house in Jersey. He had a house on Long Island. Uh, relatives on Long Island. He had uh, uh, a house uh, apartment in Manhattan uh, in the same building that Eleanor Roosevelt lived in. So I don't know how they couldn't find him, but they couldn't find him. So they tossed the counterfeiting case, which was interesting. And of course, the, uh, the it, it, details about his prior criminal record, such as it was, was interesting because it... Uh, it, it had some interesting facets that he disclosed in some of his uh, depositions and, and things of that sort. Uh, 
So that was interesting. I mean, it was also at the Library of Congress, I came across um, uh, certain files that retain related to Anna and how she sort of protected him at that point in their uh, uh, you know, in their struggles with the federal government. This is during the Kefauver hearings. Yeah. So there was a lot of stuff. And also his immigration file. Yeah. It was interesting because he gave his family tree. He had to describe his who his children were, who his wives were, and who died when and whatnot. So it was good. It was like a almost like the, the Bible, the, the family Bible. Well, and this is what's so what's so great about you know this series is we've we've tried to give our viewers an idea of how how writers do their work, how they do this research, and and how you go about putting together a book like this, and and why, for example, you would tackle Vito Genovese in twenty twenty one, but the reason is there's still information out there that nobody had dug up yet, and that's what you were able to find. Yeah, I mean, that was the thing. I, I, you know, it's a little intimidating when you're dealing with a history of a guy who's really uh, sort of mysterious and there isn't really much of a, you don't think there's much of a paper trail. There's newspaper articles, there's plenty of them. But, you know, to find something that's concrete, you have to go back mm. deep into the government records and the, you know, not only Library of Congress, but the National Archives, federal court records, Federal court records were important because of the yeah. case, so that yeah. was that was a big thing. So let's uh, so let's go ahead and circle back on a couple of these this sort of turning point moments, and and this is not only the history of Vito Genovese, but the history of the mob. So 1931, such a pivotal year. Um, you know, you have Luciano sort of. I, I don't know if how conscious he was all the way through, but there's ultimately the elimination of of two of what they call the mustache peats, right? The old guard uh, bosses in, in, and then the creation of the five families. Can you kind of explain how that all played out? Yeah, I mean, Joe Mazzaria, who was the old line boss and boss of Luciano and Genovese and Costello and some others, was into the prohibition racket, but it, he wasn't doing well uh, with these younger people. Uh, they were feeling very stifled by him. And uh, I don't think they felt very secure uh, in their position. And in fact, I don't think they were getting what they thought they would do. So it became time for him to, Luciano, to make a move. And he orchestrated the assassination of Mazaria. This was in that famous restaurant, uh, I think I'm, it's West 15th Street uh, in Coney Island, uh, the fish restaurant. And I think it was, April 15th of 1931, where Mazzaria was having lunch with Luciano. Luciano excused himself. Gunman came in. Genovese may or may not have been involved in the actual hit, but he may have been somebody who orchestrated people. And Mazzaria was shot dead. And at that point, with Mazzaria out of the way, uh, Maranzano, uh, became the nominal boss, but he had a Caesar complex, Julius Caesar complex, and he wanted to take over things in his own way. And he also seemed to not want to have Luciano and his brethren around. Uh, they were probably they would seem to be the object of a, of uh, the next round of hits. So they did a reactor strike. Luciano organized it, and they took out Mazaria. I was, I'm sorry, Maranzano at that point, was only in power for a few months. And at that point, Luciano was sort of the supreme guy, organized the commission as we've had through these many decades of the mafia, five families in New York, five groupings, uh, and some outliers like in Chicago and other places. And uh, that's the basic structure which has existed till today. Uh, yeah. And that's you know pretty much what Luciano inherited, and what Genovese inherited, as well as Costello to some extent. And so it's kind of interesting that you know it, I think Genovese became essentially uh, Luciano's number two at that point. So this yeah. is 19, 1931. He's already in the higher echelon of the mafia in New York, but the public doesn't really know much about Genovese, right? I mean, he we don't really recognized him in the public as a as a mobster in, 
till like 15 years later. Well, that's true. I mean, if you look back at some of the old newspaper clips about Vito's legal issues, he had a couple of homicide cases that fell apart, but they, they didn't identify him as anybody special. He was like a suspect in this case, suspect in this that other case. Maybe he was involved in bootlegging. Somebody tried to kill him in a, an assassination attempt. Maybe it was over bootlegging. Nobody really knew. And um, at that point, um, you know, apart from even the counterfeiting case, they identified him as a businessman in New York City, yeah, uh, a wealthy businessman. And that was about the extent of it. You know, he didn't have any sort of big reputation. So he was kind of, if not under the radar, he was really sort of in the background. Yeah. And did it successfully. So I want to I want to uh, jump ahead to World War II, but I think it's important to understand why uh, Genovese took off for Italy in the mid '30s. So it, there was he, he was implicated in a murder, as you mentioned. Uh, so how how did this end up that that Genovese leaves for uh, Italy and befriends Mussolini? Well, Ferdinand Boscia, the victim in the murder case, so I think was killed sometime. In about 1934, and it was something that was believed to be a Genovese organized hit. Um, instead, from a card game and some winnings that were uh, the, the victim was cheated out of, and other things, um, they didn't get to Genovese sensed at some point that he was in jeopardy and he had to make himself scarce. Otherwise, he was going to be indicted. He probably was indicted at that point back in Brooklyn in those days. So he went to Italy. Uh, he had gone to Italy with his wife in about 1936. This is the second wife, Anna. And it was sort of a reconnaissance to check things out. And eventually, by early, early 1937, Genovese decamped to Italy with Anna staying here with the children and the rest of the family. Um, Genovese had a lot of money with him and he was able to spread it in the right places. He spread it to Mussolini's fascist party and he became you know, somebody they appreciated. Uh, he even made the newspapers over there as being a benefactor for the fascist uh, headquarters. I think in the town of Nola was the, was the town. Um, of course, that got him into the right circles. Now, Mussolini, ironically, had his own war against the mafia. He wanted to do away with it, you know, really ravaged the Sicilian mafia. But in his own way, he was, you know, playing with one of America's major mobsters, major gangsters. Right. right. And uh, Genovese was doing pretty well over there. He had a black market operation. Um, God knows, he was probably well into his early drug days over there at this point, and supposedly was supplying Count Ciano, Mussolini's son-in-law, with drugs. He probably had a habit. So, so what's interesting, I think, about uh, this period in Genovese, and maybe this has always been the case. If you look back to 1931 as well, you you sort of the way Genovese plays this is, you know, he's with Mussolini until Mussolini is no longer in power, and then he's with the Allies suddenly. So how, how did that all play out? Well, you know, Mussolini, uh, Genovese had a, uh, had a had a pension for aligning himself with the right people at the right time. He could sort of sense where things were, were going. And when Mussolini was in disfavor, because Mussolini really, by 1943, late in 1943, he was on the outs with the Italian government. He was they he had to go to the northern Italy and sort of get out of the picture. Otherwise he probably would have been arrested. Um, and what did that leave you with? Well that left, you know, the Germans were still there. Also, uh, Genevieve supposedly had some good relations with Hermann Goring, according to Anna, the wife. They socialized, if you can picture that. But at this point, you know, by 1944, the Allies are making their advance up the spine of Italy. You know, there's a Sicilian invasion, which Luciano had supposedly some connection to. 
Um, but at that point, you know, the Germans are going to have to be strategic retreats. So if Genovese was tight with the, with the Nazis, he was going to have to find new paymasters or new uh, uh, protectors, as it were. And those were the allies, the American government. And he became and offered his services as a translator for the American or allied government in Italy. And uh, supposedly did it for free. Of course, he didn't need the money because he was running a black market racket at that time and doing very well while he was being working as a translator. <laughs> so he was so, playing all sides. Yeah, so he finally uh, decides to return to the U.S. and face the music uh, over the murder. Well, he, <laughs> I guess it wasn't his decision alone. Uh, <laughs> it was... Uh, they got onto him, the Allies, the American military police got onto him uh, because they found out he was involved in black market activity. They had a big investigation. And they learned that he was wanted in Brooklyn for the murder. So they got uh, Vito, they arrested him on the black market charges and related charges. And they put him in prison in Italy for several months. And then they deported him after some delay on a vessel with a military policeman with the improbable name of Orange Dickey. It sounds <laughs> like a soda, but it's really, he was like sort of, in some ways, painted as the hero who got Genovese uh, arrested and brought him back to the United States, where he came to the Brooklyn DA's office to stand charges in Brooklyn court. That didn't go very well. Because in New York, there's an accomplice testimony rule. Right. If you're an accomplice in a conspiracy, you can't be convicted of the crime based solely on the evidence given by your co-conspirator or accomplice. Uh, and the only person ready to testify against Genovese on the murder uh, was this uh, uh, Ernie the Hawk Rupolo. And he was judged to be an accomplice by the court and says, okay, we can't do the case against mm -hmm. Vito. So Vito skated again. And there was another, I believe there was a second uh, a potential witness who, who uh, died. Yes. There but was. we're not sure. We're not sure what happened. Yeah, he apparently took some overdose of drugs, uh, a sedative, uh, uh, and died in protective custody, such as it was. So. <laughs> hey, I'm just curious. Is that accomplice rule still in in place in New York? Uh, yeah, it still is, as far as I know. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so here's another case where where Genovese kind of kind of skates. He gets away. He uh, had a history of that. Yeah, he had a history of that. I want to talk about. Uh, we need to talk for a little time about his wife Anna, Anna Genovese. Now, there's a, a, a currently a popular podcast series about her. Uh, specifically related to her involvement with the nightclub scene in Greenwich right. Village, and um, she's an interesting character into her, unto herself. But particularly, uh, sort of at the same time, the love of Vito's life and his greatest nemesis. Right? I mean, well, she goes true. with this that's divorce true. case. Yeah. How to yeah. talk about the divorce case? <laughs> well, she she uh, this is about nineteen forty, late nineteen forties, early nineteen fifties. Anna and he were on the outs for a variety of reasons. Uh, she was claimed she wasn't being supported by him. Uh, she also claimed he had a roving eye for other women. And she filed for divorce. Interestingly, one of the papers I found in the New Jersey records was a withdrawal of the divorce action. So she withdrew that action of divorce. They were never divorced as such. What happened was that Shortly thereafter, Anna, yeah, she still wanted to be supported to a life she was accustomed to living. Uh, and you know, she filed for maintenance, I guess, or support, spousal support. And that was the big case that caught the headlines because that's where she started claiming, he's got all this money, he's head of the rackets, he runs the Italian lottery, uh, he's got bank accounts in Europe and all over the place, Monte Carlo and whatnot. Uh, I should be supported in a style that uh, would keep me in the life I'm accustomed to. And she was accustomed to a pretty good life. They had a home in Atlantic Highlands on the water. 
uh, nicely appointed um, for the, you know, for the, for the period. And uh, a lot of accoutrements and a lot of uh, uh, knickknacks, expensive stuff. And uh, she said, you know, I didn't have to pay any bills. Vito took care of it all. So at that point, when the marriage was on the rocks, more or less, she had to uh, sue, for, sue for maintenance. Support. And doesn't doesn't he turn around and then and then uh, try to divorce her? Well, they counterclaim. There's all these <laughs> counterclaims going on. Right. Ultimately, the the, the courts and he had to follow the, the paper trail on this. The courts didn't support any of their claims, so <laughs> they well, they all were sort of left with each other. I think he gave her. There was some money that he gave her on you know, a monthly stipend, but he claimed, "Look, I'm only making." Taking home a hundred some odd dollars a week from my uh, paper company on the Lower West Side, you know, what do you want from me? <laughs> if uh, if one of them had really wanted to get divorced, they would have gone to Nevada. No, uh, they could have come out to Las Vegas. <laughs> six weeks, six week residency, and then you're divorced with no cause. Yeah. Instead right. of having a judge say, "Wow, well, you you can't be divorced." <laughs> Uh, but this obviously caused some problems for Vito, right? All this publicity about his. his oh wedding. yeah, it was terrible. Yeah. Think about it. I mean, here you are, a major mafiosi, and your wife is dragging all your dirty linen out in the public. Now, the interesting thing is, previously Anna had testified to congressional investigators, denying all of this stuff, denying <laughs> she knew about the lottery, denying she knew about this. She didn't know anything about this stuff. She didn't know any of these guys. And then when the divorce or the matrimonial action started, she knew it all. So who do you believe? Which is the right, right. version? Which right. is the false version? In the end, they stayed married but not living together. Is that right? That's true. Yeah. they um, Vito took a, a, a smaller – they had to sell the house. They had to get you know, sell the house and all their property and – and Vito took a smaller house further inland from Atlantic Highlands. Anna went to her uh, old roots on the lower west, uh, lower west side, probably with her mother and with her daughter. Her, her daughter by her first marriage was Rosemary. And um, uh, that's how they sort of coexisted in this world. Interestingly, when Vito went to prison, Anna the record show, visited him along with uh, the other children. And it was some point Vito made her the beneficiary of his social security. So there seemed to be some kind of something going on there. There was some yeah. sort of connection, which is not something we expected. I didn't expect to see that. Um, so let's uh, fast forward to 1957, another year where just a lot of stuff happens. Uh, and you, know, you you mentioned it earlier. First of all, you have the assassination attempt on Frank Costello. Let's talk about that. Then you have the hit on Albert Anastasia. And then you have the Appalachian Summit. And Genovese is involved in all of this. Yeah, Genovese, of course, orchestrated uh, um, the, the uh, shooting of Costello. And although Costello wasn't killed, he got the message and uh, retired. Yeah. So if Vito needed somebody, a clear path to run in with Costello out of the way, who was really his main competition, he succeeded in that. So that was good. Vinny the Chin didn't get convicted after he went to trial. Frank didn't even, couldn't even identify him. And they became Frank good refused. friends after that. He refused to identify him, right? Well, he, he said like something to the effect that I, you know, I couldn't say who did it, <laughs> you know, and right. they became good friends after that, as it turned out. You know, they socialized a bit, uh, and um, then Vito wanted to solidify his position uh, and make his uh, stature in among the other families uh, solid, and called the Appalachian meeting, which people protested about. They said, you know, this is not a good idea to go to this little place. You don't know anybody there. You don't know the cops. In Chicago, they said, we know the cops. Why don't you come out here and we can arrange things and be better protected. No, Vito wanted to go to Appalachia. Um, and that's where they went. 
And of course, after one great coup with getting rid of Costello, he had one great bollocks. He really sort of screwed it up because what happened? The cops got onto the Appalachian meeting, such as it was, rounded up the gangsters who were trying to flee and all, did all sorts of uh, uh, you know things with uh, 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 legal problems abounded for everybody. Except yeah. for Genovese, by the way. Genovese was not indicted out of Appalachia. Right. right. Others were. Yeah. Most of it was a case of bad publicity, right? All their names were in oh, the paper. Oh, terrible. It was terrible. It was all over the papers. Yeah. Pictures, constant press. Uh, everybody, if they weren't pissed at uh, uh, Vito at that point, they pretty much were. If they didn't have any sympathy for him, they didn't at this point. And then, uh, and then, uh, you know, he gets involved. He has a big X on his back, Vito, and he gets targeted in the drug case. Yeah. They so, were going to make hella high water. So this is what one of those things where, and you make this point uh, in the book, but, you know, this was a this was an international drug trafficking case. And the, originally there were 39 defendants, Vito being the most prominent of them. And this was in, in 1958. Ultimately, the trials in 1960, or no, trials in 59. And um, this is at a time when, when you know, what you're hearing from from people even today is, oh, the, the mob bosses didn't want to get involved in drugs. Uh, they were, they were, and maybe there were a few of them that didn't want to. But the truth is drugs were always a part of the rackets, right? True. The mob, that's the great fiction that, you know, probably the, 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 the Godfather, the first Godfather movie, you know, sort of put uh, put that out there as you know, the, the, the mob, big bosses didn't like it. Uh, but it's true. From the 1930s to today, uh, anybody in the mafia, the Cosa Nostra, you know, knows that drugs are a part of life. Uh, in Vito, his associates, Carmine Galente, and Dimo Papadio, the garment center kings, uh, John Ormento, all of these guys were involved, and this is a long history. Mm -hmm. It's a very long history. So this this case, though, as a, I mean, they're making the case against uh, uh, Genovese with a little. I mean, the, you look back to the is really circumstantial evidence, I suppose, to to link him to this. Is that fair? I think that's a fair. Uh, the main witness was this fellow Nelson Cantalopes, Cuban em uh, Puerto Rican immigrant who um, came to the United States, knocked around, got involved in drugs, and through some circuitous route, became tied to some people who ultimately were tied to people close to Genovese. Now, the story is that, and this is the circumstantial part of the case, that in making the case, two Bureau of Narcotics agents were in a German restaurant surveilling Genovese at a table when they overheard Genovese being asked about cantaloupes. Could he vouch for him? And he said, oh, he's all right. Words to that effect. And, you know, to, that was the basic substance of the conversation. So it was based on that that they tied him into cantaloupes. And cantaloupes' testimony then was that Genovese was uh, involved in some big scheme to tie up the Spanish market in the Bronx. Fantastic testimony. Genovese is involved with this low level cantaloupes character and driving with him to the Bronx for a meeting. It's kind of far fetched, it seems, but right. this is what the testimony was. Now, obviously, the jury was like convinced these guys were all in cahoots and they're going to convict I them. I think that was it. Yeah, I think that was it. I mean, that one conversation tying Genovese into the everything else. And when everything else was verified by other evidence, yeah. I think yeah. swung the pendulum against Vito. That's what happened. It's just an, it's sort of interesting to me if you look at uh, something I've been thinking about lately is, you know, you look at the 1931 tax case against Capone and you look at the 1936 prostitution case against Luciano. And then you look at, at this case against Genovese. 
And in each case, these are the biggest mob convictions in our history, really. Three of three of the five or six biggest ones. Mm -hmm. And in each case, if you look at the way court is handled today, it, it might be thrown out. I mean, it's just could be. Yeah, they it weren't could strong be. cases. I, I've said that about the Luciano's uh, uh, case. I've certainly said it about Genovese's case. Um, yeah. And there was all sorts of sh other shenanigans that went on in that trial. Um, sure. But, uh, you know, that's one of the great question marks. Sure. And so we have a question from uh, one of our viewers, and I think it's a really good one. Uh, and and you do talk about it in the book uh, somewhat. Um, can, he, he, the a viewer asks, can you talk about Genovese's relationship with Joseph Valachi? Yeah, jo uh, Joseph Valachi of the famed Valachi papers and the, one of the early famous uh, cooperators of, the, of our time uh, was close to Genovese in New York. The close, but he wasn't a major character in the crime hierarchy. He knew Vito. He knew a number of other characters. Um, Valachi got done in on a drug case himself and was assigned to Atlanta Penn Penitentiary with Vito. And they had a, you know, there was a relationship. Apparently they roomed together for a while hmm. and um, in the cell. And um, uh, Valachi's version is that he feared Genovese thinking he may be a rat, an informant. Uh, and at that point, things started to sour. What really happened was that Valachi was his own paranoid self, thought somebody was trying to kill him in prison, and took a preemptive strike and killed somebody, but he killed the wrong person. <laughs> he thought, I think he thought there was Joe Di Palermo or Joe Beck who was going to try to kill him. When in fact, okay, he struck out, but he, he called the wrong guy, some guy who was not involved in any of this. Well, that's a murder in prison, in federal prison. So on top of your drug case, you have a murder in a federal penitentiary. At that point, I think Valachi saw the light and realized that, you know, this either Genovese will have me done, somebody in prison may have me done, or I'm going to spend the rest of my life in prison. So I better do something. And he turned. And the rest is history. I mean, he was the major informant. This is about 1963, I believe. And uh, gave Congress and the public the first sort of uh, in-depth look at some of the uh, things we came to come to know is the rituals and life of the mafia, mafiosi. You know, the, the, the ceremonies, the... Yeah. The structure, uh, who does what, the rules, uh, and that sort of thing. How important Valachi was in the hierarchy? Probably not very much, not very high. But he, he was he was uh, he was eloquent enough to be able to explain these things in a way that the public really hadn't really fully grasped yet. That's right? true. Yeah, that's true. And he also, of course, got a good book out of it with uh, Peter Moss. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And, and and this sort of th is something else I always think about is, you know, when you look back from 2021, especially, but even the year 2000, let's say, we, we have this we have this understanding of the history of the mob as if it's an unfolding narrative that it all kind of makes sense now. But at, when you go back to 1950, let's say, when the Kefauver hearings were starting or 1963 before Valachi comes on the stage, you know, all we get is dribs and drabs. We don't really know this story. We know just little pieces of it. And it's through these kind of investigations and, and these revelations that we end up putting together this narrative that we understand today. That's true. I think that, uh, you know, certainly in the 1930s, we had, uh, uh, you know, we had, you know, pieces of it, right? You had Luciano. He was supposed to be the big evil genius but in the 50s even to the 50s we didn't know you know what we had uh, we had pieces keith alver sort of gave us some 
through the testimony, uh, some more grounding. But later, it had to be these later cases uh, that, uh, in the later congressional cases that yeah. gave us this. Uh, and Valachi, of course. And then up to today, you know, you have all these cases where it's all second nature now to us. Yeah, and you have, the, you have a few memoirs and a few things where people opened up. Mm. It's not always fully, honestly, right? But they oh, yeah, they give but, you yeah. they give you a taste, like Joe Bonanno and people like that. Yeah. Um, we had so I have a comment from another viewer. Uh, I think this is a very interesting observation, and you would have a thought on this. He says he or she says, in my opinion, Vito Genovese was a total disaster for the mob. Uh, he was a very big fish, uh, but his power grab brought a lot of heat on the mob. You think that's true? Well, I think that's true. I think we've talked about that. You know, his, his desire to uh, uh, have this meeting uh, with everybody together against the advice of some of the more learned older folks in the mob created all sorts of problems. The publicity yeah. uh, was, was deadly to these guys. Uh, legal problems. Uh, and then, of course, you know, he gets involved in the, this drug case. Either, no matter how you look on it, whether it's true or not, he gets involved, and that puts more heat on the mob. And a lot of mob guys were involved in this. Yeah. Some very big names. So a total disaster. I wouldn't say a total disaster, but he didn't have much of a long run. It was kind of like John Gotti in a way, in the sense that, he uh, did made some strategic decisions that just didn't work out. Yeah, and hurt everybody. Well, I know. Uh, just to make reference to one of those, you know, the attempted hit on Frank Costello uh, had implications for Las Vegas, which uh, oftentimes people don't realize. Can you talk, kind of explain that? Well, as I recall, um, the connection with Costello was that the. Uh, they found certain gamey record winnings on a piece of paper in Costello, with Costello in Costello's possession. And um, that sort of opened up, I guess, the old Pandora's box about <clears throat> the mob involvement in, in uh, Las Vegas. Yeah. Which it revealed, yeah, revealed uh, basically revealed the skim or you know the money being taken off the top at the Tropicana Hotel and that Costello, uh, his involvement with that. And so he ultimately, at least for that moment, the mob kind of pulled out of the Tropicana. Now, of course, that they re they got back to the Tropicana later, but uh, mm -hmm. it, it really uh, exposed the possibility that the mob, you know, was was infiltrating Las Vegas. So, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't a big skin, but uh, it was, by today's standard, it wasn't a big skin, but... Yeah. Um, you know, it was enough, like you said. It was enough to uh, make the papers and uh, really uh, oh, sort of yeah. confirm, uh, you know, uh, the whole theory that Las Vegas was mobbed up. Um, well, good. So, uh, uh, Tony, are there other aspects of the book that you want to mention? Or have we covered the bulk of it? Well, you know, uh, the, it's interesting that, uh, you know, in Vito's early days, uh, we've talked about, <clears throat> I think, a little about this. He had a criminal history, but it wasn't very prominent and it wasn't very remarkable. Uh, he carried a gun a number of times, was involved in some homicide cases, and really was a, a guy who kind of sort of avoided by luck or happenstance or whatever you want to call it, uh, any, any major legal predicament. Um, it's surprising in some sense because you, know, you would think that, uh, uh, you know, he would have gotten caught in some of these things, uh, but he didn't. And uh, I think he, he was lucky, it was luck. He also was a, in his own way, a shrewd guy uh, who knew how to read the political winds and go with the right alliances. There's a point that in the introduction of the book, 
I refer, I refer to Joseph Heller's a vignette in Joseph Heller's Catch-22 about the, yeah. uh, the old man in the brothel, yeah. which is a classic scene I saw in the movie. And it seemed like the old man lives to 107. And he says, because I know how to, you know, I can be pro-fascist when they're fascists are in power and switch when the Americans come. He was an opportunist. And Vito was an opportunist. Absolutely. Well, um, very good. Uh, you know, we will uh, be sure to let everyone know via the comment section where you can buy Tony's book. And uh, and you certainly all you have to do is search him in Amazon. You'll find all his other books as well, including uh, uh, for the purposes of tonight's discussion, uh, his uh, biography of Frank Costello, which is a almost like a companion book to this one, I think. And yeah, uh, yeah, it is. It is. And it makes me think you should write a book about Carlo Gambino next, but <laughs> nah, yeah, you've been pushing that, right? Uh, somebody I think asked if I have any upcoming projects. <clears throat> right now in New York, you know, work for one of the newspapers, and there's a lot going on here. So I'm gonna catch my breath. But you know, I mean, there's plenty out there. I think um, you know, I think Europe may hold the source of some story. Um uh, We've talked about Luciano. Um, uh, I think those years are important years. For sure. Now you've, all, I mean, you've also done books in the more or the more recent past, the more recent history of the mob in in New York. You've Gotti and Gotti. and Mastino, uh, different kinds of people like that. Um, are there are there some more recent uh, uh, historical moments that interest you as well? Well, you know, this is. A this is an indication of, of the sort of predicament the mob is in right now. There aren't many characters that I see who are necessarily um, uh, major figures. You got a lot of third tier people, fourth tier people, young yeah. guys who are trying to get a lot of money quickly. Um, they're not interesting stories yeah. uh, to, in my mind. Look, some people can make a story out of just about any <laughs> anything. Um, but to my mind, I think, um, uh, you know, this the, a story, a book would have to have some kind of uh, larger themes running through it than just sure. I was the best, worst gangster around, I was the worst killer. You know, those are boring stories in my mind. I feel like there, there might be something uh, still to be written about the mob in the seventies and eighties when they kind of controlled all the cement companies and they, there was a, a sort of a great deal of, yeah, uh, yeah. of power at that time. There that was, think, there was, yes, that was the, the commission case came out of that. Um, mm -hmm. Also the, the old garment district was a, was a really a cash cow for the mafia uh, from the 1920s to probably well into the 1990s. And there were some interesting characters out of there. Johnny Dio, uh, Benjamin Levine, a whole bunch of people. And it was... Uh, and you have a few pages for reader, for in, people interested in this book. You have a, a few pages about that in your in this book. Yeah, that's uh, true. So Dio was involved in the uh, garment business as a, as a kind of top dog over yeah. the crime family. Yeah. Well, Tony, this has been great. I, I appreciate you taking the time to speak with us uh, today and share, you know, some stories from your book. It's a uh, it's a really fine book, and I recommend it to everyone. It it just fills another piece in the puzzle of the 20th century mob, and uh, you know, it, we had exactly the right person to write it because he knows where to find the uh, the buried bodies. So, thank you, Tony, very much, and. Uh, and good luck with your next project. Well, thank you. And thank you for having me, all of you. And uh, it was great. I had fun.